So please welcome Matt Celia and Neil Smith. Thanks, Michael. How many people have been inside? And I don't mean prison, because that's probably most of you, OK? <laughs> Dodgy characters, as the editors are. But how many of you have actually been inside a VR HMD in the last year? That's good. That's great. How many people have not been inside a VH, HM, VR HMD? Naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> you will do it soon. Yeah, go upstairs. Yep. Worth trying, but most of you have actually tried it. And let me just see, when we say an HMD, how many of, how many of those who have tried it was Google, uh, Cardboard? How many was Samsung Gear VR? Okay, quite a lot. How many was Oculus DK2 or CV1? And has anybody tried Vive Room Scale? Yeah, right. So we're going to talk about why that makes a difference a bit later on, right? But for the next 50 minutes, Matt and I are going to be flying at about 1,000 feet at about 220 miles an hour. We're going to be covering a lot of ground. And you may be dazed and confused, which if you do VR is the normal state of mind. So a couple of quick things. Firstly, VR means many things to many people. You put 10 VR experts in a room and ask them what VR is, you'll get 20 different answers. And once they've had their magic mushrooms or whatever it is they're having, you'll get 40 different answers. But VR does actually mean quite a lot of different things. And some of these things are religious, but some of them actually are quite important. When we talk about VR, there's quite a bit of a distinction between stills versus video. VR and stills have been around for a while, panoramic viewing, and a lot of the techniques we've learned in VR video have come from the VR still world. There's also a big distinction to be made between stereo VR and mono VR. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on mono VR. Some people would say, quite frankly, without stereo, you don't have real VR. And there's a certain amount of truth to that. However, if you want a lot of, lot of pain and suffering, by all means, try stereo VR. It's a lot of fun, right? There's also, when it comes to viewing, three quite distinct forms of viewing experience. And these make quite a bit of difference. There's the heavy-duty, high-end, the tethered version. And while we say tethered, is there's an HDMI, a 10-foot HDMI cable comes out the back here. You have to plug this into a fairly beefy PC. But quite frankly, that's going to be this, the, the Oculus or the Vive, is going to be the best VR experience you can get. So if you really want to experience VR and all its wonders and glory, try and get hold of a, or try and experience a tethered PC version, because that's where the resolution and the horsepower is. If you can't get to a, a Vive or a, an Oculus, then the next best thing is actually, it's not bad, is the Samsung Gear VR. You stick your smartphone in here, and that's pretty nifty. Uh, Zeiss actually makes a very nice headset, the VR1, and you can put, um, obviously, with the Samsung, you can probably put a Samsung phone in there. Well, that is surprising, I know, yep. But with the uh, Zeiss VR1, you can put an Apple in there as well as a, uh, as a normal kind of phone. And last but not least is good old uh, YouTube cardboard. And again, you can put your cell phone in there, hold it up to your head and move it around, and you get an idea of 360. But the reality is stereo VR at a high frame rate, 60 frames per second, is the, the, gold, the gold bar for VR experience. But you can get a pretty nifty idea from good old Google Cardboard. There's a lot of HMDs coming out. And anybody go to um, E3 last week? Yeah, so if you went to E3 last week, you'd have seen every man and his dog had a VR version of their game. Sony was there with PlayStation VR. Um, and once Sony starts to release that, they already have 36, 40 million um, PlayStations out there. VR gaming is going to take off just a little bit. Yeah. So just when we talk about VR, it's important to remember what aspect of VR we're talking about. We're taking the middle ground, which is mono VR um, done in a certain kind of way. But the high end is a lot more complicated and a lot more difficult. The holy grain on all this, of course, is the holodeck. And this is what we started trying to do back into the 1980s. We sold computers, crays and vaxes as big as this room, headsets this big. You had to have a chain from the ceiling. 
and the VR was crappy, right? But still, certain government agencies paid a lot of money for it. And I can tell you now, with a decent PC, possibly a Mac, <laughs> definitely a decent PC, and a decent headset, you can get a better VR experience now than certain government agencies had in the 1980s. But the whole idea is the holy grail. When you put the headset on, you go into the matrix, and you don't know reality from unreality. That's a little bit like Hollywood, right? OK, yeah, all right. So the other thing is this. This thing, this new iteration of VR, VR has been coming for you know, 30, 40 years in different guises, different shapes. This new one we call Next Gen VR um, is in still in a state of flux. And if anybody knows about product adoption curves, right over here on the left we have um, the innovators and the early adopters. That's us geeky kind of guys and gals. Then we have the great majority, and then we have the laggards who come in five years later. These are the people still using FCP7. There's none in this room, I know. Okay. So, but the point is, there's always there's that gap between the early adopters and the innovators and the great majority. And that gap we call crossing the chasm. And many new technologies do not cross the chasm. 3D TV, great example. All the geeks, all the panel vendors, everybody wanted 3D TV to happen. They sold about eight sets, but no, it didn't really take off. We are still at the stage on the early adopters and early innovator stage of the early adoption curve for VR, right? It has not quite yet made the mainstream. It is coming, for sure, but the jury's still out on whether and how it's going to take off. For video gaming, I think it's a no-brainer. For narrative and other forms of, of digital entertainment, some people still have questions about it. But it's definitely coming. And each week, new cameras come out, new workflows, new hardware, new software. So everything you're going to learn and suss out tonight, you know, by tomorrow will be out of date, actually, probably next week. But that's why you need to keep up to date. We're in a, a rapid state of growth and um, innovation. And it's cool, right? You know, if you want to be on the cutting edge, this is a bit like when the PC first came out in the 1984. I built my first PC in 84, 85, and I thought it was a damn cool thing, you know, and now we have more power in our little iPhones than we have in the mainframes we used to sell in the good old days. So these are early days, state of flux for VR innovation. And because of that, it's still very much the wild, wild west. We're still learning how to adopt the, the technology to the creative process of storytelling. Because at the end of the day, story, story, story is all that matters. The reason why it might succeed, it might stay around, is a little company called Facebook, um, who bought a, little, a very small little company called Oculus a couple of years ago for $2 billion. Two young lads from Long Beach, 22-year-olds, Mark Zuckerberg, put the headset on, Two weeks later, gave those two lads a check for $2 billion. $2 billion, nine zeros, right? Just write that out on a piece of paper one day, not on a check, for God's sakes, but on a piece of paper, two with nine zeros to two 22-year-olds who hadn't sold the product. They're still in the process of, of shipping their CV1, which is, you know, hasn't quite, well, it has actually come out, but there's been some issues. But Facebook has teamed up with Oculus, and I've got to believe that Mr. Zuckerberg is not in the charity business, right? Mark Zuckerberg is a super smart young man who already has 1.6 billion eyeballs on his Facebook social media, and he's looking to the future, and I think he sees two things. I'm not sure Mark had never sat down over a beer and explained this to me, but this is what I'm surmising. Two things. One, video gaming is a big thing. You know, more money is spent on video gaming than on movies and TV combined. It's a way bigger industry than our industry. Hollywood's a small niche and in a small niche. Video gaming is freaking big. VR gamers like the latest and greatest technology, and VR games, if you haven't tried a VR version of these shoot 'em up games, it's absolutely stunning, right? It's made for it. It's absolutely mind-blowing. So VR gaming is going to drive the adoption curve and the technology, and people are going to make a shitload of money, that's a technical term, from VR gaming, right? <laughs> I'm glad somebody's paying attention. There's one other industry as well, along with video gaming, which will also make a shitload of money from <laughs> VR. We won't go into that, but those two industries alone, I think, will sort of guarantee the adoption of VR technology into a wide segment, especially amongst 14 and 15 year old boys. We won't go into that either. Okay, so fine. The other thing about Facebook is this we think of them 
you know, as a social media company, and that's great, and I don't do Facebook, but I'm sure people do. Um, and they have the Oculus, and Oculus is a pretty damn cool thing along with the Vive. But they, at their last dev conference, F8, their head of engineering, Brian, who happens to be an ex-JPL and NVIDIA high-tech engineer, brilliant guy, who um, Facebook paid a reasonable amount of money to come and join Facebook, announced that Facebook is building, or not building, designing and publishing on open source a new 360 stereo VR camera rig. That's it. For $30,000, you will be able to build the dog's bollocks version of VR camera, right? And it's stereo. Dog's bollocks, English phrase for very good camera, right? Okay? Please pay attention. Right, so the fact that, that Facebook slash Oculus has putting serious money and engineering, engineering resource into the development of VR video gaming and now camera, and they're going to use their cloud-based um, algorithms to do volumetric computation means that we're going to start very soon having really good stereo VR. And they're also, of course, going to be streaming that onto Facebook <laughs> media on your, on your iPhone. So they're looking at both ends, acquisition in the cloud post and then streaming because video is their number one source of revenue. They think VR video is going to be a big thing as, of course, will be our social in the years to come. So keep an eye on what Facebook is doing in the VR space. We don't think of them as a you know, kind of a camera technology company, but they are got some very good engineering talent there and do some very cool things. So out of all the stuff you're going to learn tonight and all the weird, weird stuff and all the tech, there's only one word you absolutely need to know, understand, and be able to spell. And if you're in a cocktail, party anywhere and somebody says, what's VR about? This is the one word you need to say. Presence, right? What is presence and why does it matter? Presence is what VR, good VR does for you. Bad VR does vomiting, but good VR gives you presence, right? <laughs> presence is that sense of being in the movie, not just watching it. And this is why it's really ca caught, catch, catch, everybody's imagination. When you put with good content, you put these VR goggles on and you see something, it is mind-blowing. It's like acid without the drugs. Not that I know anything about acid, but I can assure you in the 60s there were people who did it. And this VR is, with the right stuff, is very, very cool, right? Presence is the sense of being in the environment. It tricks, it actually neurologically tricks the brain into having a sensation of being there and not just watching from the sidelines. Good things and bad things. Motion sickness, all kinds of things. If you don't do it right, not good. That's why there's certain things you have to be very careful of in, in when you're making VR content because you want people to have a good VR experience and not a vomitorium VR experience. And I can tell you that's very easy to do and not pleasant. Vomiting in VR, don't try it, okay? So presence, the sense of being there. And that's the and that's quite different from watching even 3D movies or IMAX movies or reading a novel, whatever, right? Presence actually does something to the brain on a deep neurological level, which is why it works so well. And it takes you into different worlds. Each week, there's a whole new uh, range of cameras come out, right? Everything from $60,000 Ozos, to you know, the fancy rigs that we just talked about, to uh, cheap and cheerful theaters and Kodaks, a whole bunch of stuff. So if you want to try it, there's a camera for everybody's budget and price, right? There's always a trade-off. You know, the more, there's out for now in this world, as my mother would say, she was from Yorkshire. Um, you know, so the more you pay, the more you get. However, there is the law of diminishing returns. Of all the cameras we've looked at and played with, the happy medium for, I think, most people in this room in this time is these good old GoPros, right? And why I say that, if I could just find, oh, yeah, so if I can say that, is this. This little camera costs 500 bucks. A little um, one of these chassis rigs costs 500 bucks. And there's all different flavors of them. So for uh, three or four grand, you can get six, five or six, six cameras, seven cameras, ten cameras, put them into one of these rigs, and you're away. You are now a expert VR DP, right? <laughs> no, seriously, you are. And um, so you can get cracking. And if you do it in the right kind of way, 
Um, you can actually produce very, very pleasing imagery. And that's one of the things that Matt's going to show you on a 10 camera rig, the stuff they actually did for GoPro, um, asked LightSail to do a special promo for them. So with 10 GoPros, you can actually get cinematic quality VR if done in the right way. If done in the right way, always there, okay? And the nice thing about GoPros are you can have put two of them together. This little rig I use for immersive journalism. I am also a roving immersive journalist. I go around and with two, I can get full 360 coverage and I can interview people and they can see me and I can see them and we can see everyone else in the room. Blah, 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 it's really nifty, okay? So if you want to get started via little GoPros, not bad. And the interesting thing is, you know, to get these, these special modded rigs here, um, you know, GoPro camera, 500 bucks. These lenses, especially from Japan, 800 bucks, right? So again, it's always about the glass when it comes to cinematography. And with two decent um, of these lenses, wide, uh, wide, wide angle lenses, and two GoPros, you can get 360 degree coverage that matches, not in resolution, but in coverage, six or seven GoPros, right? So there's all different ways of slicing and dicing and playing with um, the VR cameras. But if you want to spend what, two or three hundred bucks on a Theta, you can go out and get one or a little Kodak. Or a little Theta, the Samsung Gear 360 yep. just came out. I think that's a really good camera to mess around with. Yeah. But, you know, There's learn all... how to tell a story before you go drop in a lot of money. Yeah. So, you know, so at, and at the VR lab, we rent out camera rigs and we can help you, you know, decide exactly what your needs are and, and what, how far you want to go. Whatever cam well, however many cameras you're using, one word of advice, Make sure they're all set to the same settings, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, <laughs> you know. So, and you, that's not quite as easy as you would think it'd do. You've got to set every one of these, they're special, there are particular settings if you want to do VR. But the most important thing is that all six or seven start, they all shoot exactly the same way, and they all finish. Because if you start a scene with six cameras and you end up with five, guess what? You're hosed, right? So count them in, count them out, have all the same settings. Very important. And there's different kinds of ways you can do that. So, never mind the technology, we are in the creative business. We tell stories, right? The art of VR storytelling is also in a state of flux. People are learning a new grammar, a new way of storytelling in the same way that when we went from theater to black and white, from black and white to color, audio, all that stuff, right? And the, one of the main differences is this. The traditional form of, of movie making that we've been used to do for the last 100 years is a framed paradigm. We have a frame, right? And without even knowing it, we always, you are s setting a scene and shooting a scene and even writing a scene <coughs> with a frame in mind, knowing that, a couple of things. One, there's the fourth wall. So talent's over there, and I can be filming this wonderful, enthusiastic crowd, and the DP and the crew are all this side. And when we go and show it on, on Netflix, nobody can see the crew. They just see all your lovely faces, right? When we do this at 360, uh, guess what? Nowhere to hide, right? So I'm shooting you, the audience, but the camera, the lighting crew, where do you stick the mic? Where do you stick the lights, right? So there are, because this is a frameless paradigm, 360. It also has some implications in how you tell story. You know, you, the, you, the editing aspect of this, we're very used to cutting and going from a wide to a medium to a close-up to a reverse, all the cool stuff we've been doing for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Well, with VR, it's a different set of challenges. You can still do some of that stuff. Matt will show you how to do that and what to think about, but it's quite a different way. The frameless paradigm of VR is a totally different way of storytelling. And some people, Jim Cameron, who knows a little bit of thing too about making movies, says VR for movie making is bullshit. He's never going to touch it with a barge pole. Other guys, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but other guys, you know, welcome it and are seeing it as a challenge and are developing it, right? But if you think you can't just take a 2D script, shoot it in VR, and think it's going to tell exactly the same story in the way you're used to in the traditional framed um, camera angles, lenses, lighting, and cutting, right? There's also some other issues about where you put the talent and how close you can get because of parallax, but we'll cover some of that in the longer session. The other challenge is posting this, right? When I started VR, next gen VR, 18 months ago, two years ago, I didn't have any gray hair, right? <laughs> I'm glad you believe me. No, but I didn't have this much gray hair, right? Or I didn't have all these scars on my back 
Um, but I can tell you, VR post a little bit of a challenge, right? And the joy of stitching is something you're all going to have to learn to love and enjoy. And if you're all masochists, it will help a lot. Okay? So, um, and stitching is almost like a you know, assistant editing role. That person has to not organize all the clips and do the data rang me and go from organization by camera to organization by shots, do the stitching. It's in a very, very important part of the overall workflow. So if you want to get into VR as well as getting cameras, the other thing you want to do is think about stitching and how you're going to do stitching. That brings us to a couple of things, and I think it came up earlier. If you want to do stitching, there's two things you need. One, you need to throw as much horsepower as possible at the problem. So you need a fairly beefy GPU, either a W9100, AD100, high-end GPUs from AMD, or Titans, uh, if you're going to go with NVIDIA Titans, or the latest 1080 card, that's a nifty choice, right? High-end GPUs. You can do all this stuff on a laptop. If time is not an issue and you're not on a time-driven project, you can do it on your laptop. But as soon as you start in any kind of time crunch and you want to do VR, you need to throw as many machines as possible with as beefy as GPUs you can to cut down rendering. Otherwise, you're going to spend a day shooting and two weeks finishing and posting. So GPUs, fast CPUs, and then the next thing you really want to think about is shared storage. Because what you need to have is put all your project files, all your uh, camera files on one very fast bit of storage and then link those either to your Macs or your PCs or Linux and have as many people as possible working on the different takes. Because if you shoot you know, during the course of the day and you do 20 takes, five or 10 minutes each, to render all those out, you need a lot of, and you know, even if you're on your own, you've got two or three machines, you can start seeing, you know, take one, get that rendering, stitching, it takes a, you know, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, depending how long, then start, take two, get that going, start three. You, so if you're serious about VR content production, think about shared storage, fast GPUs. And the thing about this little baby, Jellyfish, and if you go upstairs and see Sam and Josh, this is a, a, a network attached storage. It connects over standard CAT 7 cabling. So this is just Ethernet cabling, and yet we can pull 900 megabytes per second, 1,000 megabytes per second, which is you know, as fast as, as, as Thunderbolt, over standard Ethernet cabling. So you can connect all your Max PCs together over bog standard Ethernet cabling, no fancy fiber and all that good stuff. So shared storage, fast GPUs. Invest some time, effort, and money into having those, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. Or you'll have even more gray hairs. Yeah. The other thing is think about your software. And there's a couple of choices. There's FCP 10, it's quite good, with um, the Dashwood plugins for VR, quite good. On the other hand, there's also Adobe Premiere Pro with the Metal plugins. You might want to check those out fast, especially on a PC, but you can also run it on a Mac. And the metal plugins allow you to really manipulate your VR content in a very cool way. And that will show you why that's important. Because fixing certain problems, unless you are a nuke or VFX kind of guy, you, don't, you, know, you need a toolkit which allows you to do VR manipulation in the NLE. And that's where Prem Pro and uh, Metal comes in handy. So in summary, some version of next-gen VR is coming, right? whether it's game-driven, something other industry driven, or storytelling, sports, live events, God knows well. But it's coming because Moore's Law has driven the price performance curve now. You know, for 99 bucks, you can get a headset which the military paid about $10 million for in the 80s, right? And this, by the way, is way better than what they paid for, believe me. Didn't make quite as much money on, on these, but you never mind. So um, gaming and porn are gonna drive this adoption curve. But close behind it is going to be live events, sports, um, all kinds of different coverage. And last but not least will be narrative and storytelling, right? The issue is still around business models and how we make money from it, but that's always the case. So if you want to get into VR, there's a creative aspect of it, which Matt is going to cover, but you also have to have one eye on the technology aspects of it, which covers everything from camera to workstations to shared storage to workflow. Let's get on to something much more interesting, the creative stuff, over to Matt.